Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and can I welcome you all uh, to today's meeting of the Public uh, Petitions Committee. And as always, can I ask everyone to switch off their mobile phones or any electronic equipment because it does interfere with uh, our sound systems. Uh, agenda item one, consideration of current petition. The first item of business is consideration of PE 1501 by Stuart Graham and public inquiries into self-inflicted and accidental deaths following suspicious death investigation. As previously agreed, the committee to evidence from a number of parties today. And can I welcome all the panel members, and we had the late substitute, which I'm very grateful for today. Um, on my right-hand side, if we can start, uh, Stephen McGarren, who's the Deputy Director of Serious Casework, the Crown Office of Procure Fiscal Service. Uh, then we have uh, Alan McCready, who's the Deputy Director of Law Reform for the Law Society. Um, Detective uh, Chief Superintendent Gary Flanagan of uh, Police Scotland. And Alan McCloskey is the Director of Operations for Victim Support Scotland. Uh, members have a note by the clerk uh, and paper one refers. Um, I'll kick off with some questions as there's not an opening statement. Then my colleagues uh, will also ask additional questions. And I'm very grateful for you all giving up your time today so that we can further look into this very delicately of this particular inquiry. Uh, my, my first question is uh, to Alan uh, McCloskey, but obviously any other panel member is very welcome uh, to be involved. Uh, in your view, do bereaved family members um, have enough involvement in suspicious death investigations? Thank you, uh, and good morning. Um, I think there's a, a very strong case for making sure that families are proactively, proactively involved in the whole process from the very start in terms of information, and access to as much information about what is happening as needs to be. And if they're involved, then they feel empowered. And at the moment, I think there's a gap, and I think that's one of the aspects that we're keen, uh, in terms of the petition, that I think is, is very important that, that can be factored into how things are taken forward. Thank you for that. Would other panel members like to contribute to the stage? Yes, Mr McCarran. Hey, good morning. Um, we, uh, we try and involve families as best as we can in all stages of our investigation into deaths. So typically, uh, when we receive a report of a death, we'll make contact with the family by phone or by letter. Uh, and thereafter, the involvement that we have with families will basically depend upon the family themselves and how much the family want to know. Uh, there will be limits about what we can tell them, and we know uh, about that in terms of giving statements. But at the end of our investigation, once we've come to a conclusion uh, and, and concluded the investigation and got information about the cause of death and the circumstances surrounding the death, we'll offer a meeting with the family at which point we'll explain to them the conclusions that we've come to uh, and explain to them the evidence, including any uh, contradictions that there might be in the, in, in the principal evidence. And we'll also be in a position to offer them access to post-mortem reports, medical reports, toxicology reports, other expert reports and such like. Uh, so we, we try to involve families in every stage, but we're always open to feedback in, in terms of improving the service that we give to people uh, and improving the amount of information that we know uh, that the families want. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr McCready? Uh, yes, Convener, uh, thank you again uh, for affording the Law Society the opportunity to contribute uh, to uh, its uh, deliberations over this uh, particular petition. Uh, the, the Law Society, regarding the, the gap which uh, Alan McCloskey referred to, uh, society respectfully suggests there could perhaps be another stage in the process for the small number of families of the deceased who are still dissatisfied uh, standing the outcome uh, falling upon the uh, Crown Office deliberations. Uh, there may be, uh, or perhaps there should be provision for a preliminary hearing before the sheriff in whose jurisdiction the death occurred and uh, it would then, uh, that would become a further stage in the process, an independent preliminary hearing uh, which could determine whether or not there should be, there should be further inquiry. Thank you for that. Um, Mr Flanagan. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, notwithstanding the comments that uh, Stephen said, about uh, involvement. I think it's worthy of saying that from a police perspective, a, quite a significant number of families will be involved through the investigative process. Um, we would, the, the police would normally seek um, to speak to family members to, you know, as part of the, their broader investigation to look at background and stuff. So it would just be to make that point. Uh, Amber Taggart, do you have a quick point? Um, quick point. Mr McCready, you mentioned there about another step, another process there. Um, 
Could you further explain that as to why that's not happening just now? I've no information as to the, the, the arrangements uh, that, uh, that, that, are, that exist in place. Uh, it, it would simply be a, a suggestion that where there are a small number. I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question particularly well because uh, I wouldn't want to, you know, venture into why that's not happening at present. Uh, all that the society can really do is, if, if there is an issue with uh, what would appear to be a small number of families who are still uh, disaffected, uh, st standing the uh, position of, of Crown Office, then, then it's just a, a respectful suggestion that that's something else which could happen. Perhaps Stephen McGowan can... Mr McGowan? Yes, um, thank you. Um, just to answer that point, why it doesn't happen at the moment, there's no hearing before the Sheriff. Th there's no mechanism to have a hearing before the Sheriff at the moment, so what there is is there's a, the Lord Advocate's investigation, which is carried out by the Procurator Fiscal and in practice... Um, for most deaths, that's done by the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit, which is a, a specialist team who deal with these things. Once we've come to a conclusion about the cause of death and the surrounding circumstances, and we've had that conversation with the family, there will then be a consideration as to whether or not there should be a fatal accident inquiry in terms of the current legislation. Um, and, and there may be, in some cases, a petition to the court for a fatal accident inquiry. If there isn't to be a, a fatal accident inquiry, the remedy that the, the family would have would be to take a judicial review of the Lord Advocate's decision to the Court of Session. Now, um, I, I would suggest that there isn't a gap because that remedy exists, that you can take a judicial review and you can challenge the Lord Advocate's decision should you want to do so. It, it may assist the committee if, if just give some... I looked at some of the cases that we're currently dealing with um, between October and um, the 30th of... Uh, April, and we've got 256 cases where uh, it may well be that the death has been a suicidal death. And in relation to those, <coughs> we've done further work on behalf of the families and at the request of families to clarify matters in about 10 cases. And in the remainder of the cases, um, there have been no requests to do further work, no disagreements. And in relation to the 10, I don't think there's been a disagreement as to the cause of death. There's just been further things that families have wanted to have clarified, and we've agreed that it's appropriate to go away and clarify those and instruct those further investigations. Thank you. Chick Brody. Yes, thank you. Good morning. just wonder if I may pick up on the, the last point that uh, Mr McGowan made um, in terms of no mechanism. In the papers that we've had produced by the court said that the... And if FAI, and remembering, you know, we do have this petition in front of us, so there must be some rationale behind and questioning behind what is actually happening. It says an FAI may also be held on a discretionary basis, um, by, presumably by the Lord Advocate. I mean, how does he, what process, how does he go arrive at a discretionary judgment? I mean, are there no rules, guidelines? The, the, the guidance um, that we have, we've got the Fatal Accident Inquiries Scotland Act 1976, mm -hmm. and, it, and it sets out the test. Um, and the test in that act is whether it's expedient in the public interest. Now, there's further detail to that as given by Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And what that, uh, broadly speaking, provides an obligation to do is to have a independent inquiry into the cause of the death uh, by the state in a way that involves the family um, and in the decision making and in sharing the decision making. So that's the obligation which is, is carried out. Now, is that obligation being met, do you believe, in all cases? Yes, I, I do. Um, and, and that obligation has been tested in Scotland uh, within the last few years in a case called EMS. Uh, and the court held that the, the obligation was being fulfilled in Scotland. Um, by the Lord Advocate and his role and by the fatal accident inquiry system and that there was no uh, gap in that uh, in the particular legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I just move on to my second question before I bring some of my colleagues in? Um, what options are there for family members who are not satisfied with investigations carried out by the police or the Crown Office and Procure Fiscal Service? Um, uh, from a police perspective, um, then there's the, the CAP process, so there are complaints against police. So initially we would look to um, deal with the matter um, locally um, mm. if, the, if it was raised locally uh, but then we would escalate um, the matter up through the complaints procedure in order to address that. Mm. We wouldn't do that in isolation though. 
um, because, the, because of the nature of what we are dealing with, then there would definitely be a role there for the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit. They would be made aware that there was, uh, there was, there was this, you know, families were unhappy with the level of information. Uh, I would I'd have to say, from a, you know, from my own experience, that's something which is, you know, highly unusual in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, it's not not unheard of, but it's unusual. Mm -hmm. Again, we would work very, very much hand in glove with the, the Crown uh, mm -hmm. in order to make them aware that there was an issue. Ultimately, the decisions there rest with the Crown. Mm -hmm. Mr McGowan, first. Yes, um, I, I think the first thing to emphasise is that the disagreements about these matters are very, very rare indeed. Um, in any case, where the family took issue with anything that we'd told them, it's likely there'd be a meeting, and at that meeting um, there would be uh, a lengthy exposition of the facts as they're known. Uh, we would give them as much information as possible, uh, and uh, hopefully we would get to a, a conclusion that everyone would agree with. Um, it's probably worth making the point that there are some deaths where, unfortunately, we, we don't get all of the answers because the answers aren't there to be found, no matter how thorough the investigation. But if we end up in a position where uh, the family disagree with some aspect uh, of uh, what we, our conclusion has been, um, the remedy would be if we declined to hold a fatal accident inquiry because we didn't think it was in the public interest to do so, uh, because we didn't think there was any systemic or, or, or uh, issue or anything that had to be ventilated in the public domain, the remedy is the, the petition to the Court of Session to overturn and affect that decision and ask for it to be reviewed. Thank you. Do any of the other panellists wish to contribute to that question? Maybe just a, a general comment, and perhaps for the committee's interest, um, out with this uh, piece of work in relation to the Victims and Witnesses Bill, which has just been passed. A lot of the work that was done last year through the various stages um, about making sure the bill came to, came to be uh, passed was involved, was making sure that the voice of victims was at the very centre. And the stage, before the, uh, the start of the stage one process, um, there were victims asked to come along and uh, present their evidence about their experience of the criminal justice system. Not so much about the experience of being a victim of crime per se, but actually the, the, the experience of being passed, from, in, their, in their words, from pillar to post, from one agency to another. And I think there are some parallels about making sure that the victims and the families are at the heart of this, mm -hmm. so that they're not having to retell their story and having to fight mm -hmm. for justice. Mm -hmm. It should be a, a, a given. And mm -hmm. I think there are some parallels in, in the bill. Mm -hmm. And also, in the Victims and Witnesses Bill, there's a right to complain and the rights for information, there are aspects of the bill that I think might be for the committee to actually consider and mm. perhaps uh, adopt some of the principles. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. You'll recall in the, the last session, I had a particular interest in creating a victims commissioner in yeah. Scotland and spent a lot of time working with the England and Wales victims commissioner. It was very interesting looking and comparing and contrasting between Scotland and England. I think we've lots to be proud of in Scotland, but I certainly felt there was an additional element that certainly in the victims commissioner was a very excellent model, but I realise that that ship has now sailed. But nevertheless, just to put on record, I think there's some interesting uh, um, aspects from England that we can perhaps look at. Can I go back to Mr McGowan's point? If I recall correctly, you said that um, victims could go to the court of session if there was um, dissatisfaction. Um, I mean, it's a difficult question to answer, I know, but how much is that going to cost um, and to take it to court session? I mean, is that a realistic option for ordinary working class victims that have, have had a problem? The court session is a very expensive place to get to, is my understanding. I, I, I couldn't answer the direct question as, as to what the cost is. Um, it, taking anything to the sheriff is also likely to have a cost. Mm -hmm. um, and given the, the unusual nature of these challenges, um, I, I think it would probably involve um, similar sorts of costs in terms of, um, you know, if we wanted lawyers involved, but I couldn't actually comment on the costs. One other point on the court of session rather than the sheriff, um, the investigations into deaths now are done by both the police and by the procurator fiscal by specialists, so um, the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit will be the people who deal with that. If there's any suspicious circumstances in the death, I'm sure Gary Flanagan can tell you how the uh, major investigation teams in the police work. So specialists are, are doing the investigation and making the decisions. Now, um, were there to be a right before the sheriff, there would be a danger that the sheriffs, because these are so rare, wouldn't have seen one, and therefore, um, in terms of the specialist skills being brought to the investigation and the decision-making by the procurator fiscal, the challenge might be to an own specialist. So given the small number of these mm -hmm. cases, 
that's why I'd suggest that the Court of Session is still the appropriate place to have it, because they could build a body of expertise. Sure. And it's unlikely that in the Sheriff Court you would have that same body of expertise, just because of the, right. the, 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 the limited number of cases right. that you would have of this nature. Okay. I, just following on that, this is very interesting about expertise. I mean, when we're looking for objectivity, sometimes yes. we don't want people with too much expertise and should be making judgments on the evidence that's presented before them. I'm not sure what, you know, what the difference, why we would want to go down this route, expensive route, for the, even although there are a few cases, of saying that we, we want legal decisions by made only by those that have got expertise. It's the expertise in the decision making and making sure, sure that yeah. investigations are full and thorough. So. The, the, the decision making will always be objective and it will always be on the basis of the evidence that's before us but in terms of the gathering of that evidence and the looking for evidence and for looking at the only making sure the avenues have been um, completely seen that's done by specialists and that informs the decision making so um, but the decisions are always made objectively by whoever makes them but to know the background of those investigations to know the detail to know the things which commonly arise in them and to know whether or not um, in other cases, other avenues of investigation have proved fruitful, is, I, I would suggest to the committee, something which is useful and, and, and does bear out the expertise. Thank you. And my final question before I bring my, my colleagues in. Um, has engagement with bereaved families improved since the launch of the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit and the establishment of Police Scotland in April 2013? Uh, Mr McGowan? I would say it definitely has. Um, the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit, as I've said, all they deal with is, is death investigations, all they deal with is families in relation to death, so they're able to respond better, uh, more quickly and more easily to families, and they're assisted by specialist fee officers who are dealing with, uh, for the most part, only death cases. So they, they're a much better place to respond, to learn the lessons, to take on board the feedback that, that we always get in terms of how we can improve our service in future. Um, and that specialism of approach that we, we now offer, which we weren't in a position to offer three or four years ago or more, uh, is now a big boon, I think, and, and will develop as time goes on. Yeah, Mr McCready? Uh, I really couldn't comment on uh, how, how well that's working, I'm afraid. Uh, certainly, to, to reiterate the society's position, where, where there is still the, the issue uh, of dissatisfaction, we'd respectfully suggest that uh, rather than the court of session, uh, because there's the, uh, the resultant costs, and uh, but by way of an aside, uh, uh, members may be aware of the, uh, the Courts Reform Scotland Bill, which is at present before the, the Justice Committee. It, it seeks to uh, impose a time limit uh, within which a judicial review uh, can be brought and also a test and also the fact that the judicial review is simply a review of the, the Lord Advocate's decision without looking at the merits of that particular decision. Uh, how, how well uh, the, uh, the current system uh, in, in place is working, I, I'm afraid I'm not in a position to comment upon, but uh, if there is an issue here, uh, that then uh, a suggested remedy from the society would be, uh, as previously stated by myself before the committee this morning, a preliminary hearing before the Sheriff. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, Mr Flanagan? Yeah, the, the introduction of the Police Scotland has, has introduced a, a level of scrutiny that didn't previously exist um, across and a consistency which exists now that didn't previously um, exist. Stephen touched upon the, the importance of specialism and what that actually gives us. It gives us, it's not uh, necessarily just about the information sharing, it's about making sure that the investigation is thorough and professional from the outset. Uh, so we're in a better place to give for the families the type of information that they would require. Well, I'm very confident that that's, uh, we're in an improved uh, position there because of the, the level of scrutiny mm. that's given and the availability of specialist resources across, across Scotland. Mm. Um, now, obviously, we, 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 when we look at a death of a, a loved one, we're dealing with an individual um, event for each mm. family member. And it's, it's a, a, can, can we say that we're handling those situations better? Well, I think they tie up the partnership between the, the Crown and ourselves uh, and that the level of, of scrutiny, the level of dialogue that takes place uh, now, I think probably is a strong indicator that the, the, the things are better for the families. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr McCloskey? Thank you. I think there's slightly two, two slightly different issues. Um, we will support families breathe through murder, going through a, a murder trial, but there's no referral mechanism for fatal accident inquiries. 
So, as Stephen said, Victim Information Advice Service will support families providing information uh, and advice about a fatal accident inquiry, but there's no referral mechanism, and that's one of the gaps I referred to earlier for um, families who've, uh, whose loved one has, has uh, been affected by self-inflicted uh, or accidental death. So I think there is a difference in, in that regard. Thank you very much for that. I can move on to my colleagues. Um, I'll start with Anne Taggart. Oh, yeah, thanks, convener. Um, really just going back to, you had mentioned earlier, or, or I had probed earlier about what can be changed. Is there any plans or suggestions for improving the position of bereaved family members, given that the petitioner isn't seeking to, uh, they're, they're not seeking to, to extend the FEIs, they're simply looking for a sim simplified procedure whereby families are able to challenge an investigation into death and the outcome of that investigation. What plans do you have in order for to simplify for families? We, um, as I said earlier, we're always willing to take feedback on board and, and I think Alan's mentioned an area where I think we, we'll need to work in terms of a referral mechanism. Uh, uh, to victim support. We don't have a specific plan to uh, Im improve the simplicity of, of decision making round about people who challenge uh, decisions, but we are working to make sure that we bring families into that decision as, as, as often as possible uh, and as, um, and as uh, in, in depth as possible and give as much information as possible. Um, we're going to, and we have been looking at the information that we give to victims round about just what we will give them. Now, these aren't rights which are codified in the same ways they've been in the criminal system, but we're, in effect, offering the same service uh, and the same information. And what has come out, as far as we're concerned, is uh, a lack of knowledge, perhaps, on the part of families as to what they're entitled to in terms of our policies and what we'll take to them. So we're looking at all of that again in terms of refreshing the amount of information that we give them. In terms of the simple hearing before the sheriff, um, I'm not so sure that it would be a simple hearing before the sheriff. Uh, and the reason I say that is that if there's been a lengthy investigation into a death, in order that the sheriff can consider uh, that there would have to be a legal test, and, and we don't know what that would be because there is no mechanism for it at the moment, that would have to be met. But there would also have to be a consideration of the evidence that we, we had um, obtained. Um, so I'm not quite so sure that that hearing would be just as simple. It would almost be a mini FAI in itself, and it, it could last more than a day or so. I, I don't envisage that being a simple hearing. And we've had a number of mentions this morning about um, a preliminary hearing before the sheriff, and I'm not quite so sure that that be as simple a process as uh, as has been perhaps envisaged. Convener, we have had um, a few suggestions raised this morning on, on um, how we could get round this and some of the, the suggestions involve the Justice Committee and, and the work that they're doing, but also it would be remiss of me um, not to mention um, my colleague Patricia Ferguson, MSP in Glasgow, um, for a possible Members' Bill. Now, part of that, that Members' Bill would be to make the process of investigating deaths quicker and more transparent to refer appropriate cases to specialist sheriff courts and to give the families of the deceased person a more, cent a more central role in the process. Can I ask your views on that? Just uh, th There's other parts of it, ov obviously, but just for that section. I think my position is that, that, that what that bill proposes isn't necessary in the form that it's proposed in. Uh, my view is that we can achieve the same ends by looking at our processes etc. But the, the bill which is proposed isn't something which is necessary in order to give um, the service that we need to give for victims. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Jackson Carlo. Vina, thank you. Good morning. Um, can I actually just move to the heart of the petitioner's uh, request, which is that in what I think we've established is a small number of instances, uh, a new category of mandatory public inquiry be established where the family of the deceased would wish such an inquiry. Now, I understand you will have come to this with a perspective, 
But I wonder if you could set that aside in the first instance, give us the benefit of your views as to what the advantages and disadvantages of that would be. And then I think cut to the chase and tell us what your own attitude is to the actual proposition as put. But I think we'd like to understand, for the benefit of us considering it, with all your experience, what you would see both the advantages and disadvantages of, of it before we actually know what your own particular attitude to it might be. And I'd be interested to hear all, from all and any of you in the particular order that you would like to jump in. I, 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 um, in terms of the advantages of it, the, the, the advantage and, and the only advantage um, is that there is um, a public hearing um, in relation to the, the particular instance uh, to, to scrutinise that decision. Um, as I've said to the committee earlier, I think that that public hearing is already available. It's just in the form of a judicial review. Um, in relation to disadvantages, um, there are a number. Um, firstly, um, we have the potential for people to be, um, uh, for suspicion to fall upon people when there's no reasonable suspicion. Um, so there may be suspicions on the part of uh, third parties, but objectively there's no suspicion. So you'd have a public hearing and the suspicion that a person had committed a crime without necessarily the ability to defend themselves. Um, there would be the potential for families not to agree with each other because we're talking about families as if they speak with one voice. As the committee will appreciate, families are diverse. Families don't always speak with the same voice. And uh, in our experience, uh, we have families who speak with the same voice, but also we have families who take diametrically opposite views in terms of this. So you have the potential for that. Um, and the, the, the purpose of the current deaths investigation and fatal accident inquiry system is to make sure that if there has been a crime, uh, crime can't be concealed and there's a proper investigation of it, but also where there are risks to public health, safety and welfare, they're looked at and, and so that there can't be a repeat of that. And that's really what we're looking at when we're looking at having an, a fatal accident inquiry. So, as I said to the committee, I, I think I have some difficulty in how the sheriff makes that decision without actually having an effect the inquiry. That means that the family have the right to have the inquiry as opposed to the Lord Advocate having the inquiry in the public interest when there's something that the Lord Advocate feels in terms of the health, safety and welfare of the public needs to be taken into account and, and needs to be prevented from being repeated. In effect, you have a situation where the family, to achieve their aim, would be having the inquiry rather than just the preliminary hearing, as it were. So it, it moves the thing into a different position altogether with the family, in effect, have a right to have an inquiry in every case. OK, thank you. I think that's... Uh uh, one limited benefit in your point <laughs> from your perspective and perhaps not so much uh, in mitigation beyond that. Uh, Mr McCready? Yes, uh, in citing uh, an advantage, I can do no more than refer to the Society's written evidence. Uh, if only a small number of families are dissatisfied with the creation of the statutory right to request inquiry, it might result in a very small number of additional hearings uh, each year throughout Scotland. The hearing provides closure to the families uh, who still have un unanswered questions should have minimal economic impact, particularly if it goes to the Sheriff as opposed to the Court of Session. It should uh, reinforce public confidence in Scotland's system for investigation of apparently self-inflicted deaths. And, and was your um, a suggestion made in terms of the preliminary hearing before the Sheriff intended as an alternative or as a preliminary to the suggestion within the petition itself? I think it's... Uh, well, that, that's... <laughs> I try to think about that question. Uh, I, I think it was seen uh, more as, as, as a remedy uh, to, to the situation where a family is dissatisfied. If, if there is that additional safeguard, that additional independent safeguard put in place by law uh, to, 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 to let the sheriff consider it objectively and, and decide where, where it should go if, if you have a family who's dissatisfied. So in essence, in producing it as a remedy, am I leading you in suggesting then that your own attitude to the petition is that that would be the wrong approach? I'm not terribly sure on what, uh, having looked at the petition, uh, my, my understanding of the petition was that, that, that there is something w w which is missing from the process. Right. Uh, and the, the answer to that, uh, or, or is a suggestion... Is the remedy you've come forward it, it, with? It's simply a suggestion, uh, Mr right. Carlo, that, that yep. this is perhaps something which Parliament could consider. And yet Mr McGowan's view, I think, is on this, that the number of instances would be sufficiently minimal that the experience might not be there, which was the point Mr Brodie touched yes. on. Did, I was just going to allow the other two to... to... Um, 
Yeah, I think I should um, make the point that um, death, the investigation of death is the highest priority. So, um, for um, yourself, you mentioned about the simplifying and, and expediting a process, then that's not always possible. Um, but it should be noted that we do, you know, the investigation from a police perspective is given the greatest priority. And the outcome is sometimes more difficult to determine. And that can sometimes be a difficulty for the family. And where um, we're dealing with um, complex issues where suspicion may still exist, then clearly that makes it very, very difficult for us to share information. And we're not, I don't, I don't personally envisage from my own experience we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we would be able to do that because for the reasons that Stevens uh, alluded to, we, we wouldn't know from the criminal investigation where the, where the, out, the actual outcome might, might be. Um, in terms of trying to assist you with uh, the advantages or, or disadvantages, um, we are talking clearly about a very small number and I, I can't really um, offer anything beyond um, my colleagues here in terms of how that might... Uh, yeah, I think we we have to look at each case on a case by case basis, and we'd have to you know be careful. We have to uh, examine the actual points that that, that the, each family are making as to whether or not it's possible to to be able to assist them um, there as to whether their their uh, complaint, their difficulty lies in the manner in which they've been dealt with, which can be remedied, or whether it uh, lies in the the outcome or the, the their perceived outcome that they they're unhappy with. So I'm not sure I can uh, assist you any further. OK. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, in simple terms, the petition calls for more information to be provided to families and for families to be at the centre of the process. And we would absolutely support that. As an, and that has to be an advantage to the system. In terms of disadvantages, I mean, Stephen's right, there are issues in relation to uh, family dynamics that need to be factored in. But those needs need to be assessed in terms of a decision-making but it has to be right that families get as much information and are involved in the process for this to be truly effective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chick, what do you think you would add? Yeah, I can I just take, if I may, the last point made by uh, Ms McCloskey, which is one with which I and I'm sure we share in terms of the families and given the dynamics of family situations uh, are at the centre of this, not so much the process. That said, however, I'm even more confused than I was uh, earlier on about this, the role of the hearings in front of a sheriff, which Mr McCree said we held objectively. And I asked the question earlier about uh, the role of the, 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 the court of session being more objective. I mean, help me. Clarify, please, if you wouldn't mind, the difference in the roles between where you see uh, information going to the sheriff, the sheriff court, and a decision being made, or one that is promulgated further up the line to the court of session. <laughs> I'll, I'll try that one. Uh, yes, I think, uh, as outlined uh, earlier but by myself, uh, the, the judicial review, the remedy that's in place at present, would, would simply just look at the decision that's been made. Uh, and, and, not, uh, and, and whether or not it's a proper decision as opposed to the, the merits of that particular decision. Uh, how or in what way the, uh, the sheriff uh, would uh, determine is not something, uh, or certainly something that could be considered further, but it would be held locally uh, and it would certainly be of minimal economic impact uh, to, to the public purse uh, if it's going to a sheriff as opposed to going to the court of session in, in Edinburgh. I take on board what Stephen said about, about expertise, where, where perhaps the, the judges in the court of session uh, are considering more of these cases. Uh, but uh, I, I think there's, there's definitely an issue of perception and the fact that uh, whether it's a court of session or whether it's a sheriff, that the fact that it's actually been taken out, the decision's been taken out uh, of Crown Office and considered elsewhere, uh, is something that I think uh, perhaps should, should be increasing public confidence for the, for the very small number of dis dissatisfied families. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Angus McDonald. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, panel. Um, we, we may have covered this um, briefly earlier on, but say, for example, there's a, a situation in which family members are not in agreement with uh, a holding of a public inquiry. How might that situation be, be handled um, or, or, or dealt with? Yeah, I know you've mentioned earlier that uh, there are a number of 
uh, meetings with families. I think uh, Gary Flanagan uh, mentioned that. But how, how, how would that sort of situation be handled? The, the family's view as to whether there should be a public inquiry will weigh heavily in, in the decision making that we make as to whether or not there ought to be a fatal accident inquiry. Uh, so um, it would be a significant part of our decision making. Now, it may well be that in any given death there are issues which are of such public importance to the wider public at large that despite the family's desire that there not be a public inquiry, then we would feel that there ought to be because there are issues which require to be ventilated. Uh, at the same time, if there were issues which could be dealt with in another way and the family were very keen not to have a public inquiry, then uh, we would take that on board. But the family's view is something which weighs heavily in our consideration as to whether it's in the public interest. Uh, but there may be wider public interest considerations which would say we would have to have a public inquiry anyway, despite a view from the family that they don't want one. Okay. Anyone else? <coughs> Anyone else? No. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Chip Brody. Yes, I, we may have covered this. As I said, I'm slightly confused about some of the information we've had. I wonder, you know, if you might address as to whether and how the provisions of uh, relating to fatal accident inquiries might be adapted. For example, part of the uh, stated Scottish Government plans to legislate during their lifetime to reform FOIs. I wonder if you might consider how they might be adapted in order to provide a suitable and acceptable form of public inquiry. Mr McGowan, Mr McCree. Yeah, I think it's difficult to this difficult question to answer, uh, Mr. Rodi, in terms there's various proposals which are being made by government and we've had mention of the private members bill that there already is uh, that's been consulted upon. It, it, it's a difficult question to answer because um uh, from my perspective, there's not too much wrong with the current system. It's fit for purpose in relation to most cases. So it, it's a different question to answer in terms of um, saying what could be what could be done to make it better. Easy answer could be nothing needs to be done. For the most part, I think very little needs to be done. I wouldn't like to pin my colours to the mast and say what changes I, I would personally make, but very little needs to be done to the current system. Okay. But as I said before, Mr Brodie, uh, for the small number of cases uh, where th there are still issues, uh, th then some form of hearing before an FAI uh, to determine whether or not the case should go ahead is a suggested way forward. Um, I'm, I'm bound to agree um, that it's difficult to, to see that uh, we would change something radically when there are a few cases, clearly there, there's an issue here. I didn't that say needs radically, be, I'm just no, saying, um, where are the areas of adaptation? It doesn't have to be yeah, radical. Yeah, no, so, uh, my apologies. Um, I, I don't see that there are, uh, there are obvious okay. opportunities. McCloskey? The primary one is the gap in relation to support. And I mentioned earlier, the, the, there's no protocol between the Crown Office and ourselves in relation to fatal accident inquiries. And those families will not get access to support and so they're left having to deal with the information and the whole process by themselves. And that, that cannot be right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Torrance. Uh, to ask a panel if a different system, possibly more closely related to a system of a coroner's inquest in England, might be desirable in order to meet the aims and concerns of the petitioner. Uh, I'm not sure that it would... Um, the coroner's system in England and Wales uh, means that there is a public hearing in relation to every death. Um, our experience of uh, families in relation to cases is that the majority of them want to get on and to move on with life and not to have a public hearing in relation to it. That, that's particularly so where the death may be at the person's own hand and, and maybe as a result of self-inflicted uh, injuries. And, and that's because often that will be very sensitive matters in relation to mental health, um, sexuality, family dynamics, sometimes infidelity. All of these are potential things that can be behind something like that. And to have that played out in the public eye um, is something which most families, in my experience, wouldn't think is desirable. So I don't think that that gives us any great advantage, the English coronial system. I think that we've got all of the advantages of that at the moment, but without the downside of putting families through additional distress and, and, and potential trauma uh, by going through a public hearing. 
because most families wouldn't want that in our experience. I think what might be useful, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is for uh, some compare and contrast exercise, given the very low number of cases which proceed to FAI uh, as a result of a, 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 an apparently self-inflicted death, uh, there may be uh, some merit in considering the position in other jurisdictions. I uh, appreciate that uh, in England and Wales there, there, there is the inquest uh, by the coroner in every case, and perhaps that's not appropriate for this jurisdiction. Uh, a useful exercise may be to compare and contrast with other jurisdictions as to how many inquiries are held where there has been a self-inflicted death. Um, the, I think in, in our reply to the committee, we highlight that no system is perfect, and I think this is the example given um, in the, the actual literature that was provided. I think we, we, we highlighted the, the tragic events at Hillsborough. It's just, you know, epitomising that no system is, is perfect and that uh, you're always going to find a situation where we need to look and see if we can learn lessons from individual uh, circumstances. Um, and I think uh, probably our position is that uh, we, we feel uh, comfortable, as Police Scotland, we feel comfortable with the current arrangements, recognising that uh, we, we need to continue to you know, provide the victims and families the best possible service that we can. One aspect that I would agree with Alan on is the uh, opportunity to look at other jurisdictions to see what measures are put in place. Um, so that's something for the committee con to consider. Uh, but one definite advantage of the English coroner system is that it does very much put the victims and all the families uh, at the centre of the process um, for their questions and concerns to actually be addressed. And that's an important aspect of the, of the English system that is beneficial. Mr. Torrance? Yeah. 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 John Wilson, you to point. Yes, thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, just to follow on from Mr. McGowan's comment about public inquiries and the issue, and I, you expressed quite clearly the issues regarding families and the trying to protect families, uh, and hence the reason for not adopting a coroner's court type scenario. Who makes a decision whether or not an FAI is held? Because you did make, in your earlier evidence, you gave an example whereby the procurator fiscal or the, the Lord Advocate may decide to go ahead with a public inquiry uh, against the wishes of the, the family because they think it's in the public interest. Who makes that public interest test and who carries that forward? That's a decision which uh, the responsibility for that decision sits with the Lord Advocate and the decision is made by um, Crown Council on behalf of the Lord Advocate in any case. It, it, we're talking about discretionary FAIs here. There'll be mandatory FAIs where there's been a death in custody or death at work. Those, the legislation uh, mandates that they will ordinarily happen. But for a discretionary FAI, those are decisions which are decisions of the Lord Advocate. But this is the, the issue that the petitioner is raising. And, and I know that there's areas where there is no discretion in terms of whether an FAI should be held. Uh, what we're discussing in terms of the petition is self-inflicted or accidental. And it's whether or not the evidence that is provided to the families is sufficient for them to come to the same conclusion that the procurator fiscal or the Lord Advocate has come to in their determination not to proceed to a full, full public FAI. Uh, and can we uh, seek assurances that remedy will be, or remedies will be taken to ensure that families are fully consulted about the decisions that are made by the Lord Advocate and that the information and evidence available, as long as it's not proceeding to a criminal case, is made available to families so they, they can fully understand and be part of the decision process that, that is made not to go to an FAI. That the families will be fully consulted in relation to that. Ultimately, the decision rests with the Lord Advocate. That's what the legislation says. But the families will be fully consulted in relation to that. And in terms of sharing of that evidence that's been gathered in the investigation, the reports, like the post-mortem reports, medical reports, toxicology reports, collision investigation reports, if that's appropriate, those are things, along with photographs, which we are happy to share with nearest relatives. We'll also give them uh, a summary, as we understand it, of the evidence and point to any points where there might be discrepancies in that evidence. 
And final point, convener, can we, uh, well, can I ask whether or not there'd be any uh, movement by the Lord Advocate in relation to the situation in Victim Support Scotland, uh, the issues that have been raised by Mr McCloskey in terms of the lack of referral uh, for families where they have been subjected to uh, a self-inflicted or accidental death within a family so that they, they can actually get that level of support and advice because in many respects it's not just about support, it's about advice and how to take forward the, any issues that they may have of concern uh, and could I suggest that the Lord Advocate's Office take on board the points raised by Mr McCloskey today? I think the very simple answer to that is yes, we'll, we'll take that forward. Thank you very much indeed, Convener. No, if there's no further questions and points um, from the committee, um, sorry, uh, Mr. Fanning. Yeah, could I just pick up on a, a point that uh, Mr. Wilson made earlier? Uh, just to, to reassure the committee, I've been personally been involved in investigating death for for 30 years, and I have had a number of occasions where I've actually been present with uh, representatives from the, the the fiscal service and myself and other officers where we've met with family just to go over and explain the, the findings. And that's something which is done increasingly, I would say, in the last decade. But it's something I've got personal experience. I'd like to reassure you that that's something that very much does take place. Thank you, Mr. Flanagan. Um, and there was no further questions from the committee. As uh, witnesses will know, we now go to summation. So if you can just stay with us for a couple of minutes, there's no further questions from either side. Um, this is a section is for the committee to decide what the next steps should be. And this is a matter for the whole committee. There's a number of options which the committee will be uh, aware of. One option, for example, is that we invite comments from the petitioners and the Scottish Government on the evidence that we've heard and consider the petition again once responses um, are received. Uh, but, but as always, I just want to check with the committee that there's not a contrary view or there's some other alternatives. Could just ask committee members their views on that. Chip Brody? Well, I, I think one of the recommendations should be that the petition is carried forward. Um, Perhaps the Justice Committee, with, with a, perhaps a submission to the Lord Advocate, as getting his direct view, although he will be asked clearly by the, the Justice Committee later. But uh, I certainly think it's not just worthwhile. I think it's expedient yeah. that we do carry this forward um, to the, certainly the Justice Committee. Well, there is an option, obviously. Um, uh, I think we're all arguing that we continue the, uh, this petition. We can either uh, invite comments from petitioners to the Scottish Government and others and consider it again in the future. Or there is a possibility, of course, referring to the Justice Committee on the basis that it expects to consider the draft legislation on FAIs uh, during the uh, parliamentary session. So that, in a sense, is a second, a second option. And again, that's a matter for Committee. Jackson Carlow? I would have thought for completeness, convener, it would be appropriate to allow the petitioners and the Scottish Government to comment on a summation of the evidence we've heard today uh, for us then to consider it again and potentially at that point uh, be able to forward to the Justice Committee something that was a little bit more rounded than just uh, taking it to them at this early stage. I think that makes sense. And I am Taggart. The time scale for that more roundedness. Um, I'm not sure when is the Justice Committee. Does anyone know the timetable of when they're We're aiming not, to look we at? We don't it? have that, but clearly our, the clerks liaise very closely uh, with each other on this issue, so we can report that back at a future meeting. One wouldn't want to miss. Sure, yeah. I think that's the, the point we'll take on. John Wilson. You mean, I, I'm minded that we continue for responses from the Scottish Government and the petitioner and anyone else who wishes to comment on this. There may be others who might, might want to, based on the evidence of fair today, comment. But I think, ultimately, I think it will be a referral to the Justice Committee, but not at the present That's time. Fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr Torrance. I'm happy to take the petition forward and wait on the comments from the petitioner and the Scottish Government. Thank you. That Angus McDonald. Yeah, I'm uh, content to continue and await the comments from the petitioner and the Scottish Government. Thank, th thank you very much, uh, colleagues. So, as you've heard, we are um, obviously very interested in this petition. We're going to continue this, seek the views of the petitioners and the Scottish Government. Uh, we're going to look at this matter again in the future, and obviously we'll keep you up to date with developments. And can I finally just thank all four of you for giving up your time and giving us such expert witness uh, advice and guidance today. And I'll suspend for two minutes to allow our witnesses to change round. Thank you very much indeed.
start our committee. We're now on agenda item two, consideration of new petitions. The next item of business is consideration of a new petition. The new petition is PE 1517 by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy on behalf of the Scottish Mess Survivors Hear a Voice campaign on mesh medical devices. Members have a note by the clerk, that's paper three, the spice briefing and the petition and the submissions. And uh, we've got Neil Finlay MSP and John Scott MSP, who both got an interest in this issue and are in attendance today and could welcome both uh, members along uh, today. Uh, the committee, of course, will aware that a number of cases have been lodged at the court session. As you know, the committee cannot become involved in individual cases. So no reference should be made to named clinicians and no statement should be made that would identify an individual clinician or NHS staff member. Uh, according to the rules of the Parliament, I'm being forced to stop any member or witness who brings this into the current arena. Uh, could I uh, thank the petitioners uh, and the Sunday Mail for all the work they've done in this petition? I'm sure all members would have followed uh, this very sensitive case in the pages of uh, the Sunday Mail particularly, and I think it's another good example of how a petition uh, is formatted and put forward and addressed by this individual uh, committee. So can I welcome the petitioners Elaine Holm and Olive McAvoy and also Marion Scott from the Sunday Mail uh, to the meeting. I can invite uh, Ms Holmes to make a short presentation of around five minutes uh, and to set the context of the petition. Uh, and I'll ask uh, Neil Finlay and John Scott to make very brief statements and then I'll, we'll kick off with questions from myself and other members of the committee. Um, so can I ask Ms Holmes if you may have a brief statement to us uh, of a maximum of five minutes. Thank you very much for coming along. Good morning. We'd like to start by thanking the Health Secretary, Alex Neil, for recognising the seriousness of the situation and the failures in the current system. We are grateful to him for instigating a working group of MESH victims and health professionals and are currently working to produce a new patient information and consent booklet. This will include all known risks associated with polypropylene transvaginal MESH implants. This is something we didn't have, but should be available in every Scottish hospital before another single procedure is undertaken. We would like to stress that none of what we are asking for will benefit any of us here today. We can't change what happened to us, but it's not too late to make the changes we believe will protect others from future injury, saving them and their families from pain, frustration, helplessness and possible disability. While other countries are now taking action, the US, by reclassifying MESH for some procedures as high risk, Canada, by issuing warnings to hospitals and doctors, we are failing to bring in the measures needed to protect the unsuspecting others sitting in hospital waiting rooms right now. We've been told regulation and safety is an issue for the European Commission. But if our First Minister shows political willingness to intercede over fishing quotas, we ask that he show political willingness to intercede over something having such a detrimental effect on human life. The MHRA has confirmed we already have the powers needed to make a difference in Scotland today. And too many Scottish women are being hurt on a daily basis for us to wait on the slow moving wheels of Westminster. The rest of the UK can follow suit, but let us lead the way. Almost two months ago, a US court found the mesh implant of choice in Scotland, the Ethicon TVTO, to be defective. If it is defective in the US, it is likely to be found defective here if a UK court were to examine the same evidence. But because there is no implant register here, Health Secretary Alex Neil has had to admit there are no available records to allow health boards to write to each of the women given the defective implant to warn her or to check on her health. We weren't told as many as one in five mesh implants can go wrong. And when you consider 11,000 women in Scotland have had the procedure, suddenly one in five becomes an alarming statistic. And as complications often take years to develop, we fear we may just be the tip of the iceberg. Women are still being told their pain is not mesh related because they don't have mesh, they have tape. They're still being reassured that the mesh inside them is safe, that it's different from the problematic mesh reported in the media. Both claims are untrue. Our implants are all made from the same plastic polypropylene mesh. All transvaginal mesh is high risk and must be reclassified. Using polypropylene mesh for a transvaginal procedure is a contraindication. 
Words from Ethicon's own website state, as with all foreign substances, gynecare interseed should not be placed in a contaminated surgical site. Surgeons consider the vagina to be a clean, contaminated surgical site, and polypropylene mesh is a foreign substance. Until each and every woman injured through mesh implants has been properly diagnosed and treated, and all complications judiciously recorded, we do not believe the MHRA or the NHS in Scotland can continue to state these procedures are safe, or say that the benefits outweigh the risks. The present system has failed because it is voluntary. While official figures show 328 women endured multiple surgeries, some as many as 12 operations to repair damage caused by mesh, just 12 doctor-reported incidents have been received from Scotland by the MHRA. Why didn't these doctors report the complications in 328 women? Because they didn't have to. I personally know of three women who have died following mesh surgery, but just one had reference to the procedure on her death certificate. Why? There's confusion over numbers, missing data and under-reporting, and we ask that you hear our voice and support us in suspending these procedures pending an independent, thorough investigation. This is an emerging global scandal affecting hundreds of thousands of women. We may not be able to answer all your questions, and we don't know how much these changes will cost in monetary terms, but in human terms, please just look at all the women behind us. We leave our dossier with you for further information. Thank you. Thank you very much for making that statement. I know this is a very sensitive and difficult area um, for you, so thanks very much for that. It's been very helpful for the committee. I could also thank uh, all your supporters in the gallery for coming along uh, today as well. I'd like to ask, uh, first of all, if Neil Finlay can make a very short uh, statement, then yeah. bring in John Scott. Uh, convener and committee, thanks very much um, for allowing me to contribute to your consideration of this petition um, presented so well by Elaine. There are, uh, they are here to, as representatives of hundreds of Scottish women who have received polypropylene mesh implant uh, and indeed uh, hundreds of thousands across the world. Um, and they have uh, either experienced serious complications or have concerns that they may do so in future. And this is an issue I, I became aware of shortly after being appointed to the Shadow Cabinet. It was, it was then that I met the petitioners uh, uh, to, who are here today and other MESH victims. But when they met with me, many of them, like today, didn't walk into the room where we had our meeting. Some limped or shuffled into the room. Some had to be helped into the room. Some had walking sticks or crutches, others wheelchairs. Um, they all believe that they have been injured because of the medical procedure that they have undergone. And they described to me the horrific consequences for them of, for their health of a mesh implant that they believed and had been told was a cure for their condition. Since then, convener, I have to say that the more I look into this issue, the more anxious I become. And let's be clear, this is not just a Scottish problem. It's a growing international healthcare issue and potentially a massive global scandal. That international context and the weight of evidence worry me greatly. The day I first met with Oliver and Elaine, I went to, to, with them to a meeting with the Cabinet Secretary and government officials. And at that meeting, they were reassured about concerns over informed consent and told a new process would be put in place. We were told an information leaflet would be provided and that women would be made aware of alternatives when being assessed and that there would be action to address the under-reporting of adverse incidents. We left that meeting with optimism, thinking that things would be moved on quickly. Yet here we are, nine months later, with little or limited progress. Indeed, five years after a complaint was upheld by the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman about a patient not being given information about the risks attached to this procedure, we're still not in a position to provide systematic informed consent to women in relation to this procedure. And this is obviously of grave concern for those involved, but also for our NH NHS more broadly, which I believe may have, in a legal sense, left itself wide open on this. And at that meeting with the Cabinet Secretary, uh, uh, he also suggested that evidence relating to adverse incidents was weak, with only six adverse incidents reported. 
To that, the six women round the table said, well, that must be us six then. But since then, through parliamentary questions, I've been advised that around 100 women have had mesh fully or partially removed. Then, through freedom of information requests to the NHS board, we established that over 300 have had complications. Now, this statistical inconsistency raises alarm bells for me. The reality is I don't think anyone knows how many women are affected by this, and we may just be scratching the surface. And I think that is mainly explained by the fact that doctors are not compelled to report adverse incidents. I believe that they should be compelled, and I think this petition is right in calling for that, and that the government needs to take action on this immediately and on the need to set up the register. So, short of time, are you new to the end of the statement? I will be yeah. very quick. So we have a product that continues to be used in hospitals and con uh, continues to uh, damage uh, Scottish women as more and more receive this treatment. I think the evidence from abroad is very compelling and I'm of the opinion that we should suspend the product pending an inquiry into the scale of the problem uh, and the safety of the product. And we should also introduce the rest of the changes that the women want to see. I think um, if we don't have an inquiry uh, by the government, then I think this committee, or indeed the health committee, uh, should do so and should do so immediately. And I would urge you to support the aims of the petition, and I would thank the, the campaigners and the Sunday Mail for their support in this. As we see today, we see women uh, very determined, uh, who have been willing to talk about a very personal matter that has had a devastating impact on their lives. Some left in wheelchairs, some have lost organs, and many have lost job and jobs in some their marriages. And I think this Parliament is here to represent the issues concerning communities and our people, and I trust that the committee will take this very seriously. Thank, Thank you, Mr Findlay. John Scott. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, for this opportunity to speak, and um, can I also thank Elaine for her very moving presentation. Uh, I will uh, identify absolutely with what Mr Finlay has had to say, and indeed what uh, the petitioner has had to say. Uh, I have um, a few specific points. Uh, I'm particularly concerned over the scale of this problem. If 11,000 women in Scotland are affected at the moment, and one in five are affected. That's a very large number of affected women, and there may be more. Uh, that leads me to our next point, which is concerns about under-reporting on this matter, and that there may very well be, regretfully, women who have this problem and who are not even aware of it. I'm concerned also about the pathway of treatment for women identified with this problem because it's far from clear what that pathway should be in future. I'm concerned over the lack of standardised guidelines on this subject because, to the best of my knowledge, standardised guidelines across our different health boards don't exist. And finally, I'm concerned about the risk to future pregnancies of affected women. Um, and this is perhaps the greatest concern of all. That's all I have to Sorry. say, and I thank you for the opportunity no, to be able to say these few words. Thank you again, uh, Mr Scott. Um, so thank you uh, both gentlemen for coming along. And I'd like to start by putting some questions um, to our uh, petitioners today, and then obviously I want to bring my colleagues in. Can I start with uh, Elaine Holmes? Um, you mentioned the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, which is the regulatory authority you referred to earlier. Um, how effective a watchdog would you say it is? They're not. They do not take our concerns seriously. Um, we write to them on a number of occasions. We telephone them. We get the standard copy and paste replies. They don't listen to us. Um, they say they can only take complaints if you have your full device details. Otherwise, you're put on what's called a trending database. And given that most of us don't know what's implanted inside us, it's an impossibility. Um, quite often, or more often than not, the device details are not recorded in your medical notes. Sometimes it's in your theatre notes. Sometimes your guess is as good as mine. So... Even they do not know the full scale because there's very few of us that have our full device details. 
Thank you for that. Um, Olive McGrath, do you yeah. want to come in at that stage? Yeah, I would just agree with what, what Elaine says. And they seem to be... Um, they're actually a part of the, 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 the EU um, medical directives, and most of it's dependent on the evaluation uh, of reported incidents. And with no mandatory reporting, these incidents are, are not getting to where they have to be to be evaluated. So they're not getting the reports because it's, nothing's mandatory. It's all voluntary. Um, and they seem to think that, you know, the, the, op the op operations um, of, of things... Um, oh, I kind of lost the plot. Um, it's, they're, they're not, they're, they're, the devices have not even been tested on, on, on humans um, right away from the, ver the, the, the very start. Hmm. Right. Thank you for that point. Uh, Maya Scott, do you wish to come in at this stage? After almost 40 years in, in frontline journalism, I can honestly say that I've never come across such a, a horrendous scandal. Um, these women's lives have been utterly decimated by what's happened to them. The effects are not just on the women themselves, but their families. Um, to see young women who are stuck in wheelchairs through um, what they were told was a, a simple operation um, is just... it's. It's just beyond belief. And to see these women struggling and to bravely come forward and tell the stories. What saddens me was that many of these women were told that they were the only ones that were suffering, when in fact that was not the case. And quite often it was the same doctors who were telling the, these women, each of them, that they were the only one. And I think there's a great sadness that many of these women feel very, very let down by the very people who were supposed to be helping them. And... Um, it's a great mystery as to why these doctors did not hmm. come forward and report what was happening. I, mean, I think you make some very good points. I was reading some of our evidence earlier from uh, Professor Joyce, who talked about the precautionary principle, and basically his argument was uh, that patients need to have informed consent before having this operation. Do you feel that that has happened in no, our medical practice? No, not practice? at all. Most of the women that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to hundreds of them, um, the vast majority of them were never properly told exactly what this uh, device would, would do. They were all just given a pat on the head and told this will sort you out. They weren't told what the side effects could possibly be. They weren't given alternatives. And that's shameful. The, the sad fact of the matter is that they can do six of these mesh operations for one of the alternative operations. And I think that's exactly why this has happened. And uh, I'm sure all three witnesses will be aware that the... The, uh, the European Union's got a very important role here um, through the CE marks, the European Conformity Mark. Um, as you well know, uh, with all your research you've done in the Sunday Mail over the, the years, uh, that medical products have to comply with the CE mark. And if there's complaints from either the devolved authority or, in our case, the UK authority, that that actually CE mark could be withdrawn. Is this a course of action that you've looked at in its generality? I think that's something that should be looked at and that's perhaps something we could take further. Um, but I do know that the licensing, if they have a license to use this product, this is the mesh here, this is polypropylene mesh that they use to tie up newspapers and it's the same substance that's used to put inside these women. The only difference is that the mesh holes are bigger and the, t the tissue actually grows through this mesh and when they're trying to remove it you can imagine the damage what happens is that they give a license to use mesh in another part of the body they don't have to go back again and ask for a brand new license so therefore if it's okay to go for one part of the body it's not always the same to go for another part of the body and you can see the damage that's been caused to you well, my final point before I bring my colleagues in, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. I think uh, Neil Finlay mentioned the international comparisons, and I was reading the other day that in the US, um, the mesh implant is seen as a high-risk procedure now. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think America's done exactly the right thing, and I think that it's something that Scotland can do today. Um, and I think it's something that's very, very much needed. I think Scotland needs to lead the way. America's mm -hmm. done it done exactly the right thing. I think we should really be doing this today before another single woman unsuspectingly ends up like all the ladies that are here today and all the ladies that are too ill to come. And sure. there are many of them. So yes, uh, Elaine Holmes. Uh, although America is um, proposing to reclassify mesh for pelvic organ prolapse, 
Um, they have not included mesh for transvaginal um, stress urinary incontinence, and it's all the exact same material implanted the, through the exact same clean contaminated surgical field. And if anything, mesh that's used for stress urinary con incontinence is heavier weight mesh, which in, in sense is more problematic, and that should be included. And very, I'm very conscious of time, but we're trying to keep this going as long as possible because I think it's a very important uh, debate. Could you describe to the committee in a very straightforward manner what the alternatives to MESH are? There's lots of alternatives. First of all, if your situation is maybe not seriously problematic, you can choose to do nothing. If it's for stress urinary incontinence, you might want to consider pelvic floor exercises, physiotherapy, um, continence pads... There's all sorts of things you can do. Um, the non-mesh surgical uh, options are birch copal suspension or facial sling, whereby they use your own tissue. And that was the way the procedures were carried out for years before the revelation that mesh was came into play. Um, these operations have similar success rate to mesh, but when... A birch copal suspension stops working after a number of years. You're back to square one. You have a leaky bladder. If you've got mesh and it stops working, well, we're the proof of what can happen. It can erode through your organs or your urethra. You've got the, the information in front of you. Thank you for, for explaining that to the committee. It's very helpful. I'll now bring in uh, my colleagues. Um, let's start with Jackson Carlo. Good convener, can I just declare that I have met Elaine Holmes and encouraged her in her petition, and can I thank you both for the evidence you've given and the way you've given it this morning. Um, I just want to try and get a few things into the record of the, the, the meeting as well. What is the age range of the women who are most likely to be affected uh, since the introduction of this treatment, would you say? Well, we have women in their late 20s right through to 70-plus so it's very comprehensive. Yes. Uh -huh. um, of course, the harrowing aspect of all of this is the largely irreversible nature of the, uh, of the uh, introduction of mesh because of the way it was described by Marion Scott and the fact that tissue grows through it and the consequences of all of that. Um, and yet the, the, the government's kind of hesitation, or at least the hesitation of uh, people within the health services, that it has been applied successfully to uh, for a number of women. And I, I'm interested how you respond to that point. Is it the product, because there are a variety of products that are on the market, albeit um, with the same principle underpinning them, is it the product that you think has been at fault? Is it the clinical procedure that you think has been at fault? Uh, it, uh, and how do you react to those comments that, um, for some people, it has proved to be successful? Why do you think that has been? Right. Well, firstly, on paper, it may appear the benefits outweigh the risks. When you've only had 12 reports given to the MHRA from Scotland, that would seem so, considering 11,000 women have had the operation. But there is no database, there is no mandatory reporting and there's hundreds of us litigating, almost 400, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Many of us have had multiple procedures, and each and one of those procedures is an adverse incident and should be reported. So if, if they were reported, I think we'd be looking at a very different scenario. The benefits wouldn't outweigh the risks. I'm um, sorry, I can't remember the second part of the question. And so, essentially, I think the, the argument you make is that um, if this uh, procedure is allowed to carry on indefinitely, then across the world, the emerging uh, cohort of people who have had an adverse reaction, if it were properly if, uh, reported, would be huge. And therefore, it, it may well, therefore, not be the procedure, it's the product, it's the whole principle underpinning the actual and treatment, which works. is at fault. One of the devices, uh, TVTO, which is the most, it's the preferred um, device that's used in Scotland, was recently found in a US court of law to be defective. So there is the, 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 there's definitely mesh, any mesh is, is I feel it, it's the product is defective, and that's where the MHRA is. They either these are, they are sort of we are thinking is the benefits outweigh the risks, but the benefits don't outweigh the risks when when. People are getting disabled. 
mean, I, it's, I, it's not, it's I, not min minimal. Sort no, of I understand. I, I'm just trying to get some of this yeah. into our record so that it's there. And, and just finally, con the convener, um, I think I understand that you're very clear desire is that this product no longer be used or this form of treatment no longer be used and that alternatives will be found. But, but you have um, actively engaged with government and with the health secretary with a view to trying, uh, short of that uh, becoming a reality, the proper advice be available to women uh, so that they understand exactly what risks they might be entering into. In terms of the discussions you've had, um, at what point in uh, moving those to a conclusion that you would be satisfied with and believe that that knowledge was now being communicated. Where do you think you are in relation to that? Uh, well, we're working towards new patient information booklet for um, stress urinary incontinence at the moment. Um, our aim is to make sure that women realise that A, they're having mesh because it's often referred to as a tape but it's made from polypropylene mesh, and this has got to be very clear within the information the women are given. They have to be told it's a permanent device. They have to be made aware of all known risks, and they also have to be aware that even if risks do occur, multiple surgeries may be necessary, and perhaps no resolve at the end. They just have to be aware. And, and where, where do you think that advice currently is in terms of it being at a point where it would actually be being communicated? Well, we're hopefully not too far away for having, from having this document um, in use throughout Scotland, but um, there's a few points that we haven't agreed on as yet. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr Carlock. I um, can invite now other members who wish to uh, come on. Uh, Chip Brody? Yes, good morning, and thank, thank you for the presentation. Um, we know that, you know, as a consequence of your meeting with the Health Secretary, he's taken up certain actions with regard to with MHRA and, and uh, Europe, and that new consent forms will be available, uh, I believe, next month to uh, record complaints. Let me focus on, if I may, GPs. Um, how aware were they of the implications? So there'd be no uh, channeling of information to GPs? No. And even the, the two communications put out by um, Sir Harry Burns and latterly by the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, I believe, um, they were more directed to health boards there, we need direct communication specifically to GPs because that is often the first point of call. So in, in terms of that, so consequently, there's been no feedback to uh, government, to EU and to MHRA and then the EU, as far as you're concerned. What guidance? I mean, there's a mention of um, guidance that's been given um, or had been given. Are you aware of any change in that guidance? Very, any recent change in the guidance that's been given? Or, for recommendation to or recommendation by MHRA or the European com Community? I, I, I don't really understand your question. Well, so I think the, the, recently um, Michael Matheson, the, the, the uh, Public Health Minister, said if there was any change to the guidance or recommendation is made to MHRA regarding the devices or the European community that the Scottish Government would act accordingly. I'm just wondering if you're aware of, given the comments that you've made regarding international implications, uh, of any change to or the guidance or no, recommendation? No, there's no change at the moment. The Health Minister has written to um, the European Commission and he's written to the MHRA asking them to urgently reconsider and you know, look into this um, with regards to what's happening in um, America. I think the European Commission has also recognised that there is serious problems with medical device implants. Uh, I that read up some, some inform information on that, and they are looking, they're actually planning in the future to have every implant, every patient with an implant, to have like um, a barcode or an implant card that if they do have 
any problems with their implant, it's, it's recorded. And this is where it's all about everything just now is voluntary. There's nothing mandatorily happening. It's all voluntary and it, and it depends on it, it depends on the classification of the devices and the fact that you know if an ad, an adverse incident happens, then you know if, if if they don't know about it, they don't know there's a problem. And then when they do eventually find out, the only time they find out is when hundreds and thousands of patients come forward with complications, and by that time the horse has basically bolted out the stable, and you know we're in the situation we're in just now. Clearly, we can't go into specifics, but I wonder if you could just take me briefly through the kind of conversation that someone might have with a with a GP regarding uh, this product. In general, if, if if I was going to my GP initially, it was you know the symptoms. I was getting tested for all different you know poss possible causes, but at the same time, the GP wasn't aware of m mesh medical device complications, and. I kept saying, no, it's my mesh, it's my mesh. She said, no, no, we've did this, we've did this, we've did this. But she had no knowledge of the actual complications to, you know, eventually right. I was referred on to, to a consultant. But prior to the recommendation, or, you know, you know when, when the, the problem was diagnosed, were you, were anybody taken through the range of options? I mean, how much focus went on this particular product? You mean from the consultant? When from, the, was, from the GP or, or the consultant? The only time I, I consulted my GP was when I started having problems. And then you would be referred to and a then consultant? Be referred to a consultant. But the, the GPs are unaware of actual mesh complications. For, in an education point, you know, my GP didn't know anything about mesh medical devices or complications. Okay. And eventually, after all tests were exhausted and most were coming back inconclusive, I was referred on. I think if, if a patient presents to a GP now with mesh medical device complications, complaining of any symptoms as per the BSUG um, list of reportable complications that should be getting reported to the MHRA, they should automatically be referred to a consultant rather than the GP going through months and months of trying to find out. I appreciate that. But, and, and again, we, we have to talk in generalities. We can't be you know, talk about specific situations. But what I'm trying to get to is, is there a preponderance when, when advice is given? Is there a preponderance on advice that this is the answer as opposed to any other uh, possibilities, any other devices? Is there a preponderance to say this is the solution to the medical problem, i.e. the they say, well, they can't really sort of give advice if they don't know the information that they, that they need to give the advice in the first place. Now, and yeah. GPs are totally in the dark. They're still totally in the dark, even after getting letters um, from, you know, the, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, that there's still a lot of confusion about um, mesh medical implants. No post, as you point out, there's no post recording of... No, situation. there's no registers. Everything's, everything's voluntary. There's no mandatory regulations whatsoever. And, and that, does that, do you know if that applies internationally as well, in terms of recording? I'm not sure internationally if, if they have... Man, I, I, would, I would guess there's nothing mandatory there also. Is Marion, are you available? Do you know, do you know from your... Investigative. I think some of the, the countries are busy looking at this, this whole issue as well. Um, in respect of the doctors not recognising things, I know from speaking to a lot of the women here um, and a lot of the other women who can't be here, a lot of them were actually dismissed and told that they must be imagining things, that, that it was all in their head. Some of them were even sent to psychologists, psychiatrists, when they were actually suffering horrific physical when this stuff cuts through your organs, it cuts through like cheese wire. And you can imagine the physical pain that these women were going through. And because of the long delay for the GP to get to, well, maybe it is a mesh implant and it's causing the problem. At that time, the tissue has already grown through the mesh and trying to get it out is really, really problematic. There's only a couple of doctors in Scotland who um, are used to taking this stuff out. And when you see the scale of the problem, 
That's completely and utterly inadequate. Great, thank you. Okay, go. I'm McTaggart. Thanks, convener. Um, and firstly, I would like to declare an interest in having are in the process of dealing with some constituency casework with regards to this issue, um, and also just about to thank the women obviously for your presentation today and for the other women that are here to support and Marion for the hard work that you have done bringing this um, issue to the forefront of people's minds. Um, one of the questions, we have went round the issue about non, not being registered. How far back would this procedure go? Uh, I think late 90s, 1998, I think, for TVT, which is for stress urinary incontinence, and I think 2003 for um, TVTO and pelvic organ prolapse, somewhere in between, I'm not quite sure. And to date we've had, to date we've had um, 11,000 women who have went through that procedure. Well, it's approximately 11,000 right. because there's no accurate no data. Accurate <coughs> that's in the last seven years, oh, that's those figures. There's, there's no records available before that. Convener, I have, um, obviously through the casework that I have been dealing with it and, and have been trying to get questions answered myself, having been a member of this committee, I think, I don't know, about two years now, maybe, maybe more, maybe less, it is a non. I'm, I'm not sure if, if the women are aware um, that it is a non-political um, makeup on this committee. So we don't we don't talk about political parties in a sense. We take each petition as it comes in. Um, and on that note, uh, this is this is this happens to be one of the most horrific um, petitions that I've ever came across within this committee. But I'm unsure as to why we haven't done anything. You know, if this has been flagged up, and I've, I've heard it being raised within the chamber, if this has been flagged up nine months ago of, of the details that we're getting just now, I'm really unsure and surprised as to why nothing has been done about it. And I'm not saying nothing has been done about But surely there's not enough being done about it. We're asking for the, these procedures to be stopped and for it to be fully investigated. I'm not sure why we're not doing that. Clearly, would be, um, obviously, at the end of uh, the discussions we have today, it's up for the committee to talk about next steps, but I'm sure the committee would want to write to the Scottish Government, for example, but that's a matter for the committee at the end of the session. Have you any further questions for the witnesses? Not just now. Okay, John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, and thank you very much for your evidence, not only in terms of today, but also the other written evidence we've received in the the weighty document we received as we just sat down to consider this petition uh, from the Sunday Mail. The issue for me is one whereby the, you've raised a number of concerns uh, and you've also indicated that you've had meetings with the Cabinet Secretary for Health and health officials. And first of all, I'd like to ask, what assurances, if any, did you receive from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and the health officials about the potential request to suspend all operations until this is fully investigated? None. None. Um, he's refused to suspend. Yeah, he's, he, um, the Cabinet Minister said there's a fear of being sued by the mesh manufacturers. So they, they've refused to suspend, uh, even including the fact that we don't have any proper procedures and advice booklet available for women who have been recommended this type of operation. Uh, he refused to suspend yes. until that document was produced and we had clear guidelines issued to all uh, practitioners in relation to advising patients of the options and the dangers, yes. potential side effects, I should say, yes. uh, of this operation. So there's no indication that it would suspend. Uh, and that from both the Cabinet Secretary and the health officials as well. The health officials have not taken or given any indication they would be prepared to consider suspension no. of these no. operations. The other question, and, and it goes back to Anne McTaggart's question, that you've put in the submission, uh, along with the petition, that there's was it over uh, 10,700 
uh, have had the uh, operation, uh, but that's just based on FOIs because there is no accurate data prior to 2007 because it wasn't recorded. Uh, do you think that 10,700 10, is an accurate figure or is it way out in terms of we could be potentially looking at double that figure uh, of women? It, it's just difficult to know because there's just no accurate data for reporting, for database, for follow-up, you know, keeping track of who's suffering as a result Unlike the car industry, if there's a problem, they can issue a recall. They can't do that with MESH because they have no clue. There's no precautionary principle when it comes to medical devices. It's like if you ground an aircraft as well. It's, it's, you know, if something goes wrong in, in the airline industry, the, the aircraft are grounded right away. That doesn't happen with medical devices. They don't have that precautionary principle where they'll stop the line and investigate. They just keep putting the medical devices in while, you, while they're waiting to, to find out what the problem is. Telling us the benefits outweigh the risks. As other members have uh, mentioned this morning, that it may be that we are just scratching the tip of the iceberg here in relation to the cases that are coming forward. In terms of the survivors network, are you finding that the the demand for information through the survivors' network is increasing on a daily basis? Yes, yes definitely. Right. And, and these women are struggling to do this on their own. This is the only support network they have is each other. We're not no. medically trained, we're not yeah. legally trained, we can only offer support. Right. That's about the only thing, the good thing that's come out of these mesh medical devices is the new friendships that have, have evolved through you know, finding each other. Because initially everybody was sitting thinking that they were the only the only were one. Unique. We were unique, and that's what consultants were telling telling you when you were going to see the consultants. Like you know, oh, the same is, consultants. This, the same consultants. This is very rare, you know. So, you know. So, that, so that's the evidence you're picking up from yeah, the yes, survivors' yeah. helpline in from, terms from, of from it's, 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 the same names are appearing. Same, yes. Same yeah. Names. yeah. Yeah. No. Consistently. So there's an awful lot of very rare and very unique people. Yes. Uh, can I thank you very much, convener, and it leads me on to a couple of recommendations which we'll sure. deal with thank, later on. Thanks, Mr Wilson. Um, as I said, um, we are over time, but I've taken the decision we should extend the time because I think this is important to do that. Um, will members perhaps who haven't contributed wish to say anything at this stage? Uh, uh, Jackson Carla, did you have a... I, thank you, convener. If I can yeah. just have a, one supplementary. I've left this deliberately to the end because I thought it was important to hear the very um, factual evidence that you gave. Um, but these are very personal stories, and I just wonder if the two petitioners would share with the committee how their lives have changed. Okay. Um, I can walk from my front door to the driveway. That's as far as I can walk. I now rely on a wheelchair. Um, I've had severe left-side nerve damage. Um, my life isn't what I envisaged for myself, my husband or my family. Um, we've learned to live with it. We have good days and we have bad days. Um, but like all have said, we've gained support from each other. I've basically, you know, the life I had, I did have, was a healthy, active, employed life. And, and I don't have that anymore. Now I'm disabled, basically. I've got chronic pain, like, got brush your teeth in the morning, pain, you know, sitting, walking, I, I can't, I'm like Elaine, I'm, I'm determined not to be in the wheelchair, but, you know, it would make my life so much easier if I was, so it's, it's just constant symptoms, there's no off switch for the symptoms, and that's the same for, for all the girls that we speak to. So. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, and again, thank you for providing such sensitive personal information that it does help advise the committee uh, in, in looking forward to the next steps. Um, do any and members of the committee have any final points before? I would like to ask Neil Finley to a very brief point. We are very short of time. Uh, could you keep it very short, Mr yes, Finley? Yes, very, very short. short I think the question for the committee is, and I, and I say this, um, you know, given that it's a very male-dominated committee, but uh, I'll say this is a general question. Would any of you have this operation if you know what you know now? Would you allow your wife, your partner, your daughter, or any female relative to have this operation? 
And if the answer to that is no, then I think you know what this committee has to do and it has to act on behalf of these women who have been so brave today. Th thank you very much, Mr Finlay. Um, as you probably gathered from the previous petition, we're now at summation, so we've stopped asking questions. Can I conclude the statement? If you, if if you make short. it very short. Um, right. It's just basically on behalf of everyone that's uh, Scottish mesh survivors, thank you all for listening to us and for considering our petition. I would like to thank our families, all who signed our petition, poli politicians from all parties for their support. Special thanks to Marion Scott and the Sunday Mail for the Hear Our Voice campaign. Thanks to the mesh injured girls and all that made it along today to support us. Special thoughts to the girls not well enough to attend. Uh, the eyes of <laughs> mesh uh, injured women across the world are watching what is happening here today in the Scottish Parliament. They are all relying on Scotland taking the initiative and leading the way to prevent even more victims being, being harmed by mesh implants. What we are asking for is so very little when you compare the human cost as well as me, the financial burden of doing nothing at all. Our suggestions will ensure that proper early warning systems are put in place, and we believe these simple measures can easily be adapted to protect anyone undergoing any implant procedure. Please make the, cha the changes to prevent scandals like this in the future, so no more, no more lives will needlessly be destroyed. Please study our dossier. The evidence is over overwhelming. Please hear our voice. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for making that statement. I know it was very personally difficult. And although technically I'm not allowed any applause in the gallery, I'm making a decision on this occasion and we're going to allow it. Um, we're now at summation, so that we've stopped asking questions. Um, and, but I would ask you just to stay uh, where you are. And certainly my own personal view in the three years I've convened this committee, I think this is one of the most significant petitions we've had. And thanks again to Sunday Mail for all the work they've done in highlighting this. I'm sure to speak for other committee members must say that we clearly need to continue this petition. And I, for one, would certainly want to get the views of the Scottish Government, uh, the Mental Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority, the NHS National Services. But also, I do think it's important that we do write to the European Commission, because they, as I said in my earlier question, do have a regulatory role. And if the committee are agreeable, uh, we had a provisional date to go and meet the European Petitions Committee in October. That hasn't been confirmed yet. But if the committee were so minded, it may be that we could visit one of the DGs who've got responsibility for this particular issue. But again, that's just my individual view, and it would be for the committee members to look at the next steps. So I've, I've set out some parameters. I just wonder if perhaps if I start with the Deputy Convener, Chick Brody, on, on your views on the next steps. Um, thank you for your presentation again. Um, this committee doesn't make formal decisions or the finality of decisions and recommends um, further action. On a personal level, I have no doubt that um, the evidence given supports the action that you're asking for. Uh, to that end, convener, I suggest not only we write to the Scottish Government, but that we clearly carry forward the petition mm. and invite the Cabinet Secretary uh, to come to the committee and explain the actions that regrettably are not yet in, in our hands where we have to discuss with the EU. But I am frankly, once again, disappointed that we seem to have products entering the marketplace which, in which we have no confidence or little confidence. And uh, I think that's for another day, but I do think that we should invite the Cabinet Secretary to come and uh, discuss this matter with us. Thank, thanks so much, Mr. Brodie. So there was a recommendation then, which has been continuing this. We write to a variety of organisations. Uh, sorry, John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. I've got another, another couple of recommendations to make who we write to. First of all, could I suggest we write to the Royal College of Surgeons mm. and the BMA to seek their views on these procedures? 
I could also suggest we write to four health boards in Scotland, and I've just randomly chosen Lothian, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, Ayrshire and Arden, and Fife, to ask them their views on the issues that have been raised by the petition and the evidence we've heard today. I would also seek, uh, as part of when we write to the Scottish Government, Royal, uh, that we ask the Scottish Government what advice is being provided to GPs on the issues raised in the petition. Uh, because clearly the first point of call after the operation for many women is their GP because they don't get a direct referral to the, back to the consultant. And we clearly, based on the evidence, uh, the GPs need to be made aware uh, of the, the issues that are being raised and the complications that are coming about so the G women do not feel they are on the, left on their own to deal with an individual case. And lastly, uh, no, it's not lastly, Convener, could we ask the Scottish Government and uh, what procedures will be put in place to ensure the appropriate recording of complications, either at GP level or at hospital surgeon level, uh, of this procedure? And lastly, but not least, reinforce the call for the suspension of all such procedures until such time that we have assurances and other factors in place that people have informed consent can be given on the issues raised by this petition today. Uh, thanks, Mr. I think, I think that's a very uh, comprehensive list of additional recommendations, um, so I cer would certainly endorse. Would other members uh, like to come in? Jack Carlo. Similarly to say, convener, I feel a weight of responsibility on the committee with this petition. Uh, some petitions we hear, I don't believe, are time critical, but I believe this one potentially is time critical because whilst it might be something the Health Committee might otherwise have been expected to consider, they have their own very busy and detailed agenda, we've heard evidence this morning, and in a way I feel we should feel compelled to act on that evidence. And so I think I would very much, whilst uh, and just picking up a point Chick Brodie made, but maybe giving just a little bit more urgency still to it, that while we might be seeking the views of others, I would very much like us to flag up with the Cabinet Secretary at the earliest opportunity that we would like to have the opportunity to discuss with him the issues that have been raised. Because I think, whereas sometimes that might be the end of the process in this instance, it might only be an interim step on the process of action this committee might wish to recommend. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Carroll. For that, in fact, my own thoughts were that we would, in, um, if the committee agreeables, we'd invite uh, Mr. Matheson or Mr. Neil to attend two weeks today, which is our final meeting before the recess. Alternatively, as you know, we have uh, a meeting scheduled in August as well. Um, so um, the, the, the client will certainly make that clear to uh, the Minister's office. In fairness, the Minister's always been uh, reasonable, uh, very reasonable about turning up when he's had a request. So I'm not looking for any problems on this front. I'm at Taggart. Yeah, thanks. Um, just to agree with what's been said on the recommendations going forward, but also for the committee to have some background information um, on some of the procedures elsewhere in the UK, if we're able to ask Spice for that information. Uh, we'll certainly speak to Spice. Uh, thanks for Amit Tiger's point. Is there any additional point? Which, did you have I mean, a final I mean, point? As usual, uh, Mr Wilson, very comprehensive in terms of uh, his recommendations. Uh, I do differ, though, in terms of approaching four health boards. Uh, we shouldn't be selective about this, and I think we should approach all health boards um, so that uh, uh, all are involved in what should be a very timious exercise. And I do think th that we need somebody here uh, before recess mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, there is a quite clear action plan going forward. Yeah, I agree with Mr Brodie on that. I said we've one further meeting, but certainly it will be my view that we, they should be here in uh, two weeks' time. So I will certainly keep um, the, our, all our witnesses here today up to date. So I think you've heard from the committee that we, this is a very, very important petition. I think we've taken this very seriously. We've tried to cover every single option that we can. And um, clearly, if uh, Mr Neil or Mr Masterson are here in two weeks' time, you, you are certainly, as you know, are very free to come to the gallery uh, on that uh, occasion. So can I thank all of you for coming along, both our witnesses and all the supporters in the gallery today. It is a very sensitive area, but clearly the committee feels this is extremely serious and we'll do everything we can to pursue the aims of your petition. Thank you very much for coming along and I suspend for two minutes to allow our witnesses to leave.
we could uh, restart our committee. We're on agenda item three, consideration of current petitions. Uh, the next item business, PE 1319 by William Smith and Scott Robertson on improving youth football in Scotland. Members have a note by the clerk, the submissions from the Scottish Youth FA and the Children's Commissioner. Um, in light of the evidence heard at the last meeting, the committee is invited to consider what action it wishes to take on the petition. Uh, one option, as members will be aware, is to invite Scotland's Commissioner for uh, young and uh, for young people to review the current registration process from a rights perspective and report back to the committee uh, with his findings. I could ask the committee their view on that recommendation. Uh, I think that's fine, give you that. Uh, um, but I think I'd also like us to invite a, the Scottish Schools Football Association um, to give evidence at the, the same time. Okay. Can I bring in other members? Just got a comprehensive of you. Um, Angus MacDonald. Yeah, thanks, uh, Convener. I certainly welcome the submission from Tam Bailey, um, the Commissioner for Children uh, and Young People, in his belief that uh, a review of the current registration process from a rights perspective um, should, uh, would be beneficial. So I would certainly agree with the uh, uh, recommendation that we invite um, him to review uh, the current registration process. I wonder if we can try and sort of make a link between the two. Um, I would be keen to go ahead with the Commissioner, but could we get the information that Chuck Brodie is asking for and make sure that information goes to the uh, Young People's Commissioner yeah. so that he's fully aware of all the information, so that it's all joined up? Mm -hmm. certainly makes sense, yeah. yeah. John Wilson? David Torrance? Are members, all, are members all happy with that recommendation? Okay. Yep. Um, so we're going to invite Scotland's Commissioner for uh, Young People to review the current uh, registration process. Um, if I move on to the next current petition, it's PE 1460 by Susan Archibald on behalf of the Scottish Parliament Cross Party Group in Chronic Pain on improvement of services and sources to tackle chronic pain. Members of a note by the clerk. Um, clearly, there's been a lot of work done, I think, in fairness by the Scottish Government in this particular issue. And I think hopefully our work in this committee has made a bit of a difference. Um, um, I don't see what further work is available in terms of this petition. And I think it's been excellent work by Susan Archibald. And I'd like to thank her and the Cross Party Group for the work they've done. Um, so I would then suggest, uh, unless members have any other options, that we close the petition under Rule 15.7 on the basis that a chamber debate on chronic pain took place on the 29th of May. Uh, may uh, that a consultation on the future provision of specialist chronic pain services is held, following which the establishment of a new specialised residential chronic pain management service is being taken forward. Uh, Jackson Carlow. I personally would have preferred to leave the petition open until the government had finally confirmed the absolute establishment of that new centre. I believe the Cabinet Secretary hopes to be able to do that before the commencement of the recess. Uh, and I know that uh, I have every confidence that he will, but I think for completeness sake and particularly the investment that there has been um, by so many people in Susan Archibald's petition that if we could get to that point and then draw a formal line under it, knowing that we had made that final achievement uh, on their behalf. Yeah, I'm, I'm personally relaxed about that, but just to bring in other members, John no, Wilson. Can I say, uh, put on record, both Jackson, uh, Carlo and my uh, interest in this issue as co-conveners of the cross-party group in chronic pain and could I su suggest we support Jackson and Carlo's suggestion that we hold on to this petition and like Jackson and Carlo I would uh, agree I think the cabinet secretary and the minister are about to make that decision in uh, public uh, but I would prefer to hold on to this petition until such times as it is made public. Are other members of the committee agreeable? Yes, thank you very much. So we will continue this um, in light of uh, Jackson Carroll's points and look at this again in, in the future. Um, if we move to the next petition, uh, it's PE 1482 uh, by John Wormsley on isolation in single room hospitals. Members of note by the clerk. Um, Alec Ferguson, MSP, has a constituency interest. Um, I don't think uh, he's been able to attend, but I would just, for the record, mark Mr. Ferguson's interest in this petition. I uh, could invite contributions from members. Members will be aware there's probably two main uh, options for action. We could write to the Scottish Government to request that cost-benefit analysis of 100% single rooms as opposed to 50% over the course of the hospital's lifetime be undertaken, or we could defer consideration of the petition until the Scottish Government's review of the research of single-bed accommodation in the hospitals is complete and the results of the review published. Can I ask members' views on either option, or indeed if there's other options, members have been interested to hear them. Can we, uh, uh, just on, on, on point one, um, I think given that we uh, are aware of hospitals being built with 
uh, single rooms. It's not just the, the cost benefit in terms of operational cost. It would be instructive to look at the capital costs involved in building 100%. Uh, and we should have that information sent from uh, south of Scotland. 100% uh, single rooms as opposed to 50%. So uh, it's not just uh, an operational cost. Clearly, the more important issue which is the, the research in terms of the sociability of, of uh, single rooms as opposed to uh, shared, in some cases, 50% accommodation. And that's, in my book, the more important issue, but I, don't think, uh, I do think we should still ask for the, the um, capital cost situation. Thank you. Um, just touching on Mr. Brody's point, I think in Annex A in the yep. Spice Brief there was some issues about the capital costs, but I don't know whether Mr. Brody wants to check whether that's sufficient for his purposes. And then Chancellor Carlaw? It, well, it's rather satisfied mine, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, but, um, I, I, I'm not altogether sure what more we do do with this petition. Uh, I think that the Scottish Government's policy is very clear. I think that the Cabinet Secretary has indicated that he would undertake a review. I think that um, it would be interesting, uh, if we are going to continue the petition, to invite the Scottish Government to start to provide some feedback on the uh, attitude of patients who have actually experienced uh, single-room uh, hospital accommodation, because my understanding is it's been very favourable and that some of the questioning that underpinned uh, previous surveys of opinion was predicated with some rather pejorative suggestions as to what they might be likely to experience, and in fact the reality has proved to be quite different. Um, so I think, personally, I feel we've given the petition a good airing, and I think that the government's undertaking that there will be a review in due course in order to ensure that um, uh, they learn lessons from it is probably as much as the committee can reasonably expect. I'm slightly less persuaded about drilling further into the cost-benefit analysis as an issue of policy in terms of the government determining what they believe to be in the best interests of the health of patients. And I'm not quite sure where, you know, whether the light bulbs cost more or not in those circumstances is, to my mind, relevant. Just to be clear, Mr. Garner, you, you're suggesting it's uh, option two to defer consideration to the Scottish Government review. Excuse well, me, my own personal view would actually have been to close the it's petition close. Okay. Uh, on the basis that a review has been guaranteed by the government to take place okay. uh, at some point, and I think that uh, is, right. is, a, is a sensible and pragmatic course of action. Can I ask other members' views? Uh, Can I maybe? just come back on I mean, I, I, I disagree uh, wholly with this because of the, as I mentioned, the, the, the um, sociability. The concern I have is the Scottish Government's review of the res they're doing research on single bedded accommodation in hospitals. I, I trust that uh, we're not just talking about whether single bedded accommodation is good or bad, but also looking at the alternatives. And I think uh, that, you know, in terms of, the, uh, and I disagree with Jackson, I think that uh, in having some multi-bedded uh, areas in hospitals is, has a very good social and healing effect. So I would keep the petition open. And the, and the costs are important. That can ask other members. We've effectively got two options. We've got a closure or keep the option, keep the petition open. I think until the Scottish Government's review is complete, Mr. Brody, that was you. I think your suggestion. Mm -hmm. Can I ask other members, John Wilson. I'm quite happy to keep the petition open at the present moment, convener, okay. and seek those additional uh, answers to the questions okay. that have been raised. Thank you for that, David Torrance. I'm quite happy to keep the petition open, convener. And Taggart. How long do we have to wait for? The other information to arrive? Um, well, the review will... Uh, well, obviously, we'll keep a close watch and see if government when that review is complete. So the Scottish Government will announce that. The other information is a factual one, so I wouldn't expect it to be, get that in the next four weeks, I would just expect. The review is over the course of a year. Yeah, so, so the review is over the course of a year. So do we keep it open for that length of time? Do we keep it well, open that's the length of the review, so that would be, well, that would be what the continuation would be suggesting so we can keep a watching brief on it and in the meantime um, the other piece of information has to be sought yes that's good mm. we have kept other petitions yeah. open for, for that lengthy time I think we have to complete it okay thank you for that and finally Angus McDonald yeah I think um, given that the 
petitioner in his email of the 26th of May um, asked or requested that we write to the Scottish Government uh, on the um, to task that a proper yeah. cost benefit analysis yeah. is done. I think we should honour that request okay. uh, as well and uh, certainly keep it open. So I think the majority position is that we continue the petition to get the view over and we seek the piece of information that the petitioner was, was asking for. And obviously we report this back to um, to a future meeting. Uh, I am bound to say, Kavina, I do not, really? for the life of me, understand why it would take a year to do research accommodation of single bedded and multi bedded accommodation. Mm. You know, the, the tail is wagging the dog in some of these situations. And, mm. and it's, you know, we, we really need to ask the question. Sure as to when we expect mm. these things to be completed. Yeah, well, if, if members wish, the, obviously we're, we're expecting um, Mr Neil to appear before us for another subject, the, the previous uh, petition. If people want to ask further questions, that's totally in order as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure the response, which would be entirely reasonable, is he would actually like some people to experience single-bedded accommodation in order to be able to comment yeah. upon it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that might take some little while. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's an offer or not. <laughs> So I, I think we could continue this for some time, but uh, let's draw a line under this. Um, so we're going to continue this until the review is complete, and we're going to ask for the information that the petitioner is requesting. Um, can we move to the next petition, then? It's PE 1488 by Pete Gregson on behalf of Kids Not Suits and Whistleblowing Local Government. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Um, again, I think this is a very comprehensive uh, petition. Uh, can I ask members' um, views on next steps? I mean, because clearly there is an issue that the petition is mostly about policies that matter for locally elected representatives. Obviously, Audit Scotland, the Accounts Commission, is responsible for auditing these policies. To date, it has not identified any weakness related to whistleblowing, which is required to be flagged up in the annual report for the uh, for a local authority. And obviously, we've had a lot of information from local authorities about it. If members are happy with that, we forward and um, we can close the petition. If they're not, um, please suggest some other course of action. Recommendation, if that helps. On the, on the basis that silence is assent, um, <laughs> we will uh, close that petition on the basis of the points I made earlier. And if we move to the next current petition, is PE 1497 um, by Ailey Harrison, on behalf of Say No to Tesco on supermarket expansion on local high streets. Members have a note by the clerk uh, and the submissions. And we have got uh, Patrick Harvey, MSP, here today, and Sandra White, who have recommended some uh, very useful uh, points. Um, can I ask if there's, we can have a sort of very brief comment from Mr Harvey and Sandra White before the committee uh, look at its deliberations? Thanks very much, Convener, and I appreciate the opportunity to say a few words before the committee considers the petition. I'm here really to urge the committee to take the petition seriously. I think very few people would uh, want to do away with supermarkets. Very few people would deny that supermarkets, when they came into the, uh, the high street, added something uh, genuinely new, something additional to the, uh, the retail environment, to, the, to the, the sector. We've got reached the point, though, now where the scale of the domination by a handful of multinationals uh, really is, is getting absurd. I remember about 10 years ago, the Scottish Parliament was discussing some of these concerns, and at that point, the big four controlled somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of the, the, the retail uh, sector in, in this country. Now it's getting close to 90% and still expanding. Now, I, I know that the petition raises some specifically local issues, but I think all members will recognise that this is something that goes uh, right into every community. Dense urban communities, rural communities, very many of them find that what competition means uh, in retail is now simply a choice between one supermarket and another, rather than the rich diversity uh, that many communities used to enjoy. So whether your priority is, as local and national government talk about, uh, diversity, vibrancy in town centres and competition, or whether your priority is some of the arguments around shorter supply chains, greater trust and local resilience in local economies, which supermarkets, because of the nature of their logistics, are always going to be bad at. We're going to see continual problems with the long, complex supply chains that gave rise to the meat scandal in recent years. Whether you're, you're talking about those sustainability arguments or the competition arguments, I think we should recognise at this point that the objectives that 
governments are setting, local and national governments are setting, for those, those uh, for a, a rich diversity of, of retail offer uh, and vibrancy in town centres, those objectives are not being met. And I do hope that the committee will consider very carefully whether through use classes or some other mechanism, for example, giving local authorities the ability to consider the cumulative total of floor space that an applicant has rather than simply the individual premises for which permission is being applied or for which permission may not be needed. Whatever the mechanism, I think we have to recognise that the public policy objectives which governments have been talking about for a long time are not being met and, in fact, are being undermined by the continued dominance Potentially, we could be here in another 10 years seeing 95% plus of the retail sector in this country being controlled by four companies. <coughs> That's not competition, and it's not sustainable. So whichever side of that argument you fall on, I think it's time to recognise that objectives of, in terms of the common good are not being met. Thanks, Mr Harvey. Uh, Sandra White, if you have just a brief comment. Thank you very much, convener, and uh, thank the committee for giving us the opportunity to speak to this. And, uh, thank uh, the Justice Committee for finishing a wee bit earlier today that, to enable me to, to come down. If I could possibly even look at the local issue, obviously, Ellie and others, uh, petition emulated from an issue uh, in the Great Western Road area of uh, my constituency in Kelvin. Uh, but as Patrick said, it's not just about that area, it's other areas also. We have seen uh, in the past number of years small localised shops closing down. Uh, we have areas of Mary Hill Road, some in my constituency, some in Patricia Ferguson's constituency, which basically all the small shops have closed down and we just have big supermarkets in the area. You take that on board with, uh, say, local shops, not just employing local people, but using local produce as well. And it's something which adds to uh, the diversity of an area such as uh, my constituency in Kelvin. We have the Kelvin Bridge area, the Finiston area, York Hill, etc., etc., where the small shops are closing down simply because Tesco's and others uh, have opened up. Uh, there's also the issue of land banking by these big mm -hmm. supermarkets, which buy up the land, and they sit vacant for 12, 20 years even before they actually put forward a planning application to that. So I would just ask that, yes, you, you know, as I see this issue, it's not just a very localised issue, it's all over Scotland, not just in my constituency of Kelvin. But I must say, when you know, you're walking about an area, the diversity of the local shops is something which you know, is great, and it brings people into these areas as well. You can go to your Tesco's anywhere, or I'm not just saying Tesco, there's others as well, but you can go to huge supermarkets anywhere. They all look the same, they all sell the same produce. You go along a high street or otherwise, uh, and you've got a diversity of shops selling a diversity of goods, and that can only be good for the local area. Now, I know we're looking at the MP3, the planning uh, issues as well. Uh, maybe local government could look at the petition. I, I don't know. I'll leave that up to your expert selves to decide what to do with the petition. But I would, uh, you know, plead with you to, yes, have a look at this petition. It's not just happening in one area. It's happening throughout Scotland as well. Thank you very much. And as members will know, uh, Sandra White's uh, written to us and given us some helpful uh, suggestions. Uh, suggesting that we ask the Scottish Government about the use of the retail impact assessments for shops of under 2,500 square metres and for its views on the suggestion by the Federation of Small Business that the Town Centre Master Planning Toolkit takes into consideration the issues raised by the petition. Are members happy with these, these two suggestions? Okay. Brody? Well, I, I, I'd just like to make uh, a phone comment. I met with Professor Lee Sparks, who is now head of the Town Centre the partnerships uh, and there's some and he was a professor of retail at Stirling University um, who enlightened me with the fact that supermarkets out of town supermarkets are now uh, some of which have been built covering 100,000 square uh, feet you uh, realize that there is a vast need of reduction uh, to something like 60,000 square feet and what we're talking about in the petition here is is uh, supermarket expansion in our local high streets. And I think, well, I appreciate uh, Sandra White's uh, request about the RIAs. Uh, of course, we can't just talk in those terms about uh, supermarkets uh, opening you know, shops of that size or what have you. We're talking about all shops under 2,500 feet. Uh, and I make the point I made earlier. I, am, I have no truck for supermarkets at all. Uh, I find it... Uh, there is not a level playing field, but we're also suffering, of course, from internet shopping, which is affecting shops in the high street. 
Um, so I, I, mean, I understand there's a, there are localised issues and I have them in my area as well. Uh, but we have to be uh, recognised that if we were to restore the vitality uh, and viability of town centres, then it becomes difficult to say, well, we're, not, we're going to have these shops and we're not going to have these shops. Recognising, I believe, that supermarkets are the out of town supermarkets are on seriously on the wane, and you just have to look at their results, and that will uh, provide enough uh, sustenance to that argument. Jackson Carlo? Uh, I, I, I think I've said previously, convener, I've been unpersuaded by the evidence that we've heard. I don't regard supermarkets as some evil empire, and what we've been asked to do here is to restrict um, the supermarkets owning smaller convenience store sized units, many of them in formerly abandoned Woolworth stores and others, which in many town centres lay derelict with, for years with nobody expressing any interest in operating them whatsoever. Um, I also have repeatedly gone to Sandra White's constituency. I am attracted to that particular uh, corridor of Great Western Road and then Bars Road. I find the diversity of shopping they're remarkable. I went to school round about there, and the shops today are very different to the shops that were there then. But I would expect that in the nature of retail, that units will progressively and always change. What is fashionable and what is desirable is completely different now and will be again in the future. Having said all that, convener, I'm very happy, though, to support uh, Sandra White's suggestion that we write to the Scottish Government seeking their information on the specific proposals that have been made. And I'd be very interested to hear hear the feedback in respect of that. Are members agreeable to that suggestion? Thank, can I thank uh, Patrick Harvey and Sandra White, uh, honorary member of the Petitions Committee for coming back. Thank you very much. Um, the next petition is PE1500 by Stuart Houston, OBE, on behalf of RSPB Scotland on the Golden Eagle as a national bird for Scotland. Members of a note by the clerk and submissions. Um, can invite uh, contributions from members. Uh, clues a couple of options here. One is that we ask RSP Scotland to undertake a public consultation to enable it to demonstrate there is widespread support for the concept of the national bird and for the choice of the golden eagle over other bird species. Um, or we could suggest that the Scottish Government undertakes research on the benefits of assigning further national symbols. Um, I, obviously, this was a significant one in that was our 15th petition. And I know some members have got quite strong views on this, uh, but I would I welcome members views around the table. Uh, Jackson Carroll. I hesitate, convener. Um, I thought that, I mean, I would like to return to the Minister's response to the previous consideration, which I felt was a very comprehensive uh, response. And I would be very interested to know what the Minister's uh, response or uh, thoughts are on the various responses we have subsequently received. I have to say I felt that the response from the conveners of the various other committees was mixed uh, and must be described in some cases as indifferent. Uh, and in one case, uh, where the enthusiasm was expressed, the I word was used rather than necessarily the committee's view. And I wasn't altogether clear whether it was the convener's personal view or whether, in fact, it was the view of the committee concerned. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, I thought that the minister articulated the concerns in relation to the value of national symbols and also the process by which they might be adopted very well in his letter. And in a way, I would be interested to know whether he feels, in the light of everything else that's been heard, uh, the government feels that a case has been made or a process that he would feel appropriate has been identified. Thank you, Thank you for that. Can I ask members' uh, views on Jackson Carlos' suggestion as we write to the Scottish Government effectively with the evidence we've currently got? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's fair. You know, the concern that uh, was expressed before, I think not to the same extent about the, the national tree. I hardly see people running around saying, hooray, we've got the, the pine as the national tree of Scotland. I suspect that while it's good to have that as a symbol, I suspect the golden eagle, uh, Mr Carlo permitting, would, uh, would follow the same route. Um, do members of, uh, agree with that course of action? Uh, right, so we're continuous to write to the Scottish Government with all the evidence we've received and we'll continue this uh, petition to a, a future date. Um, uh, the final two current petitions today will be taken together. That's PE 1510 by Jody Curtis on behalf of the Emergency Services and Non-Emergency Service Call Centres. Um, 
and PE 1511 by Laura Ross on the Inverness Fire Control Service Control Rooms, members of a note by the clerk and submissions. Um, I think I mentioned before that subsequent to the petition be lodged, um, Laura Ross came to speak to me about the generality of this uh, particular issue. And there's a number of options here. Uh, we did write to Justice Committee, as you call, about this. Um, and they are certainly, they've got a subcommittee which is looking at some of the workings of, which have covered some of the areas uh, that these petitions are involved in. Um, and it d does seem sensible that we could put both of these petitions to the Justice Committee to look at this in, in more detail. Clearly these are very important issues, but Justice does have a current subcommittee looking at this work. People agreeable? Okay. Um, and if members are agreeable, because I'm conscious of the time, would members agree that agenda item four, the inquiry into tackling child sexual exploitation in Scotland, be um, uh, deferred until our, our meeting in two weeks' time? I'm keen that we don't lose this into the recess, but there is a couple of issues I'd like to raise on that, and I don't think we can do it justice in the time. I think members will agree it was right to keep the MESH inquiry going a bit longer than, than we had uh, time for. Um, I think on that basis, um, can I formally... Can I just sorry, agree with you on that? Uh, sure, one thing, uh, and perhaps you know, there's a personal feeling and view, that you may have two questions. I've got many questions of the government's approach in terms of the response, yes. so it does require yeah. meaningful time. Well, I think that's a good point, and clearly we are uh, asked the clerk to make sure that we schedule um, a, a decent... A chunk of time in two weeks' time so we can discuss it further. Uh, if there's nothing further, can I formally close the meeting and just ask members to stay back for two minutes, just a couple of quick points.